I think we all know that people are living longer and longer. So what we see is more and more centenarians around us, like the lady in the slide here at 102 years of age, shown next to an image of herself 80 years earlier. But the question I want to turn to is what might happen to longevity in the future. And for this purpose, I want to address a list of questions. Now, I'm not going to be able in the time available to answer all of these questions, uh, but what I hope I will be able to do is to provoke some discussion and to get some issues uh, onto the table. So the first question that we need to think about is to understand why it is that aging occurs at all. If we look in the wild, we find that it's actually very rare for an animal to live a great length of time. So there's no need to evolve an aging program in order to clear space for future generations. Instead, the body is programmed for survival, so that even in the last days and minutes of our lives, everything inside our bodies is trying to keep us alive. We're programmed for survival, not programmed for death. But the important point is that because deaths occur so often in the natural world, there is no real selection for better longevity than is needed. The body is allowed to live its life because it has a whole amazing array of longevity assurance mechanisms. The consequences of limited investment in longevity is that in time, in a protected environment, you see the effects of aging affecting everyone. Now, this tells us why humans have a long lifespan, why animals like a mouse have a short lifespan, because in the wild, animals don't live very long. And what it also tells us is something about the nature of the aging process, that aging is driven by random defects, molecular defects and damage that arise in our cells, leading to an accumulation of defects in the organs of our body that result ultimately in frailty, degeneration and death. If we look at the historical increase in life expectancy, we see in this remarkable graph how this graph shows the life expectancy for each year of what was then the longest living country in the world. And it shows how life expectancy over the last 200 years has nearly doubled. It also shows in the top right corner the slow waking up of demographic agencies like the United Nations to predicting the future. The reason is that if we look in the rear view mirror, we see what was driving longevity to that point, which was reducing death rates in early and middle years of life. But what has dominated the picture recently is that we are becoming better and better at surviving. And what this points to is that the picture that I showed you previously was not quite complete, because there are things like our lifestyle, like our nutrition, like the environment that we live in, that can exacerbate aging, and there are good things we can do with our lifestyle that allow the body to make the most of its longevity assurance systems and help us live a long time. Now, the first question is, might we evolve extended longevity? We've reduced our mortality so much that the potential clearly exists, and we know that there is the necessary genetic variation in human populations and heritability of lifespan. We know also that proof of principle for being able to evolve longer lifespans has been revealed in experiments with fruit flies. But of course, there are big obstacles to this. One is the managed reproduction that we practice. Another is menopause, although conceivably we would evolve a later age at menopause. And then there are potential trade-offs uh, in the body, uh, for example, between the potential for fertility and longevity. We can come back and discuss these further in the session that follows. Might we be able to engineer greater longevity? There's great excitement to exploit the potential to target mechanisms for aging. There are many, many mechanisms thought to be involved in aging. Proof of principle has been demonstrated in short-lived animal models, and the approaches include things like metabolic regulators, the clearance of senescent cells, and so on. But the challenges are major, and they include the complexity, the time scale that would be involved in doing this, the potential side effects, and regulation and ethics. Again, complex issues we can discuss. Perhaps the most interesting opportunity comes to equalize longevity for all. We know that there exists in our societies a major social gradient in life and health expectancy. We know that there is proof of principle for being able to modify this. A great example we can see in Germany. Following the division of Germany in the 1950s, 60s, 
we saw that life expectancy in former East Germany declined relative to the West. And then in the decades that followed German reunification, we saw that the, chain, the curves converged back together again. The challenges here are the complexity of the process and how to identify cost-effective interventions. What it really needs is commitment and political will. And so just to conclude, uh, we know that the determinants of current longevity are becoming clearer. We know that the future evolution of increased longevity is possible but uncertain. We know that life extension by direct intervention is theoretically possible, but we should be careful in our expectations. Modifying the social gradient offers perhaps the best and most immediate prospect for further change. And of course, we should remember throughout that quality of life is paramount. Thank you.